Yes. Hi, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, coming to our second uh, seminar of uh, the semester. Uh, today it's our pleasure to have one of our own, Dr. Shubhashi Bhattacharya from uh, ECE, uh, talk to us about some of uh, his uh, research on flexible AC transmission systems a uh, machine for smart grid. As you may have heard, this uh, this is a buzzword these days. So uh, Dr. Bhattacharya uh, got his, B, uh, his BS in EE and MS in EE from uh, Rurki Institute of Technology in India and uh, from uh, the IIS, the, Institute, the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, and his PhD degree from University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, he has worked in this fact, the flexible AC transmission uh, systems and uh, a custom power uh, group at Westinghouse. And uh, he's also uh, worked in ATEC, full of acronyms, Advanced Transportation Energy System. Uh, he's, uh, uh, well, he's joined the uh, NC State in uh, 2005 as an assistant professor. He's currently associate professor. And uh, without further ado, he's also a member, of course, of our Freedom Center. Uh, without further ado, I'll let uh, Dr. Bhattacharya take over. Thank you for accepting to talk at this seminar. Okay. Floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Krim. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I am a faculty member in the EC department. And uh, this seminar is really prompted by a couple of things that happened very recently. And one of the things I'm going to talk about, uh, as you see on the screen, uh, flexible AC transmission systems machine for smart grid. And I'll try to explain what that is. And as I said, that this is really prompted by a couple of things that happened recently. And let me go to that quickly. I want to advertise that I'm also part of the Engineering Research Center Freedom uh, at NC State. And uh, I'm a core faculty member uh, leading a thrust area on solid state transformers. Also part of the Advanced Transportation Energy Center, which is co-located and is part of Freedom. Coming to the topic today, just this month, um, actually, one of my grad students pointed out to me that the IEEE Spectrum picked the top 10 technologies, top 11 technologies of the decade. And, and uh, you see this out here. So this is this month. And uh, they've got a bunch of things. And one of them is uh, called facts. So since I had actually burnt my hands on this, and I'll let you and uh, we'll go through how and what I did and how was I involved. I thought it's, it's uh, at least important to let our department know and people here know what this technology is. Because it has come up as one of the 11 in the last 10 years. Also, I want to actually advertise something very, very important. And that is the US innovation. And I'll give you a little bit of history. And that's why these three people are on the screen here. So as a young, bright and bushy tail engineer, I was hired at the Westinghouse Science and Technology Center in Pittsburgh. Unfortunately, Westinghouse does not exist anymore as a company. This Science and Technology Center in Pittsburgh at one time had 3,000 people and working in all areas of engineering and science that we can think of. It was one of, the, one of the best and engineering centers or, or technology or research centers of this country. As you know, Pittsburgh developed because of a lot of, because of steel and because of Westinghouse. And Pennsylvania Railroad is the first electrified railroad in the whole country, a whole, whole world that was done at Westinghouse. Coming back to this thing, there was a bunch of 15 people not even 15 maybe, 10, 12 people, who I term as cowboys, who actually, and Dr. Laszlo Juji was their leader, who actually took it upon themselves in the 1990s with Electric Power Research Institute funding 
to develop this technology called fax. This was developed right at Westinghouse and as I said, this was only done because of what I call the cowboy attitude of actually just developing something without, you know, there was no major corporation behind this. This was a research institute in Westinghouse which did this, okay. And so it's really, I'm trying to pay homage to these guys because this is the innovation that was done solely by 10, 12 people and their foresight. And now this technology is all over the world and I'll show you what this means. So as I said, Dr. Laszlo Juji was, uh, was, the, was the program manager or the, or the main researcher of our group. And there were two other people, uh, Dr. Colin Schroeder and Eric Stacy. And I was extremely lucky to work with these guys, okay? So, one important thing that we hear about is that the power transmitted per kilometer of high voltage line has just been going up. But the problem is that there are not too many lines being built because of a lot of different reasons, okay? So that means that existing lines have to carry more power because the load is growing and the power consumption is growing. So which brings to the point that we got to be now very careful of actually rationing power over every line because we don't want one line to get overloaded while the others are not loaded at all, okay? So that's one of the problem statements. The next thing is that we love the AC transmission because long back Westinghouse found out how to transform and build transformers. So that means that we could change the voltage levels from the generator to transmission to high voltage such that the power losses were minimum over long distances. So that same long distance actually became a problem later because in, in a simple AC circuit that you can solve, the power flow or the current is only governed by two things the voltage magnitude and the angle between the two sources or between different sources and over impedance. And as these power systems or, or our networks became more and more meshed, the path of power flow from point A to point B became unclear. So if you had a point A to point B and the load was sitting at one point, the load would get served, the load would get its power but it was unclear which line carried how much power. And again, with the problem statement, as we said, that now with more and more power requirement, we want to precisely control power every, over every line, okay? So there's a bunch of problems that came up because of these long distance and what, which we term technically voltage stability, which basically means that we couldn't control the voltages at different points to the required levels that we want. We have a reactive power problem, which means that, that there is a reactive component of current flowing in the lines, which is not delivering real power to the loads. So it is adding losses. We've got problems of steady state stability because some lines are getting overloaded and we can't change the impedance of the line once they are built. We've got problems of transient stability, which means that if there is a fault on the system, like the 2003 where we had a cascaded failure of the whole Northeast because of some tree limb falling somewhere. It's hard to even correlate those two things. But those are problems because, because of transient stability. And more complications with what we call subsynchronous oscillations, which is low frequency oscillations between different generators at different points, okay? Bunch of more problems with interconnected systems. But let's go into some solutions now. So this, as I, as I said, that this was kind of seen by these group of 10, 12 people, you know, sitting at Westinghouse R&D Center, which is a completely R&D center, was that this was coming. And so started developing this fax. And here is a, a tutorial on what that is. Outline of what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about voltage source converters and how to actually make 
these voltage source converters or electronic generators behave exactly like our generators that we know, which are big machines. Okay. I'm, talk, I'm going to talk about topologies, how to make these things or build these things. I'm going to talk about control. And then the most interesting thing is, is uh, field results. Some of the requirements here, of course, when we talk about technology, the first thing we list is cost. Second thing we list is reliability. So these are pretty standard and kind of buzzwords, you know, which we don't really technically mean or know uh, sometimes how to quantify. But a couple of things we know how to quantify is that, as I said, we want to build converters or electronic generators which are no different than our generators like at Niagara, right? And so they have to be complete, they have to be operating at very low losses because we are competing with these generators. So which means that the loss of these systems should be less than 1%. So if you have a 100 megawatt generator, the loss should be less than a megawatt, okay? They should, ha they should be no different than our machine generators or rotating generators. So they should give out the same high quality voltage waveform that we get from these machines, okay? They should be scalable and redundant. So if parts of it fail, they should still be operating. And give us partial rating availability. And then the next thing is that from the circuit point of view, think about a simple voltage source, right? From the circuit point of view, all we know is to put them only in two ways into a circuit, and that is either in series or in shunt. There is no other, other magic here. So think about a voltage source converter that you built, and you've got a circuit, and only thing you can do is either put this controllable voltage source either in series with the circuit or the line or in shunt, okay? So that's what we want to do. We want to control both real and reactive power, and we want rapid disturbance, uh, rapid response to disturbances on the system. How big these systems should be? Anywhere between 25 megawatt or MVA to 250 MVA. Why not any bigger? We've got enough challenges here. So let me, let me go into what these are, okay? So as I said, this is a machine. So we want to build an electronic generator which is built of switches and an energy storage device such that we can switch this and connect this voltage source either in shunt with a circuit or in series to give us controllable voltage. And this, as we said, this voltage should look no different than a real generator voltage. So real generator voltage is sinusoidal. So we want to actually approximate and make this voltage source as close to a sine wave as possible. The best we do is that what we call a 48 pulse. That means we approximate the sine wave with a 48 pulse. Why? Because the total harmonic distortion of this waveform is good enough, okay? So that's, that's, the, that's one of the things connected in shunt. So if it's connected in shunt, what can we do? Think about a very simple circuit, right? So that means that we've got this voltage and we can inject current either lagging or leading, right? Because it's AC such that we can regulate this voltage at this point where it's connected to. So that means that if I build this electronic generator and put it in a transmission line, I can control the voltage I can regulate the voltage at the point where it's connected. So why this is important? Because over long transmission lines, the voltage will sag as we have the voltage drop or the losses. So as I said that there are only two ways, right? So the other, other thing is, problem statement is that, okay, we can make this voltage generator and put it in series with an existing circuit or with a transmission line. So what are we doing in series? Instead of 
injecting a current here, we are injecting the dual, which is the voltage. So we can inject a controllable voltage across this series coupling transformer to do what? Such that we can control the current in the line. So very simple circuit principles. No, no new stuff, right? So all we want to do is we want to change the magnitude of this current flowing in this circuit or in this transmission line such that we can control the power flow. Okay? And here are some simple phasor diagrams to explain because it is at constant single frequency which is 60 hertz. Okay? So we can inject this voltage either positive or negative such that we can buck or boost increase or decrease the line current magnitude by doing this. Another very important thing, in both of these systems, we can do this or we want to do this without transacting real power between the line and this device. So what does that mean? So in both of these cases, we want to build this electronic generator such that it does not need a power source, which is basically saying that there should be no real power flowing from this circuit into this generator, or there should be no real power flowing out of this generator into this circuit. Right? Very simple statement. So all we got to do is that from our circuit analysis, we have to make the voltage and the current in quadrature, right? So if we, if, we, if we make sure that this injected voltage that this generator is injecting is always in quadrature with whatever line current is flowing, right? Because this is an AC circuit, so it's got phase and magnitude. Then there is no real power flowing between this device and the circuit. So very simple principle. And by doing that, we, we saw that with the shunt, we can regulate the voltage. With the series, we can buck or boost the magnitude of the line current. And that's a very useful thing. Okay. So now we've got the basic building blocks. right? And now we can actually start doing permutation and combinations of these building blocks. So we had a limitation in the first two circuits saying that we cannot transact any real power, right? which limited us to injection of this voltage by the series element always in quadrature with the line current. Right? So if you want to re remove that constraint, then I need a power source. I either need an energy storage or some kind of a power source. So I can now start thinking of combining my shunt generator with my series generator such that there is a power flow through the DC side. Okay. And what would this power flow do is that it would remove the constraint that this now this voltage vector or phasor can be injected at any angle with respect to the line current. And the resulting power flow will be matched by the power through this converter and through the DC side. Very simple principle again. Okay. So that opened up another, uh, another function here because now I can inject this voltage at any angle with respect to the line current, which basically means that I can control both the real power as well as the reactive power on this line. Any questions on this basic functionality. Yeah. How the real power is being transferred? The real power, if, if you inject a voltage at some angle with respect to the line current, which is not 90 degrees, then you have a real power which is flowing between this transmission line and this device. And then this, this real power will go through the DC bus and if you didn't have a power flow path, then it would basically either discharge or charge the capacitor. So you need a path such that this power 
this extra power can be shunted out and given out by the shunt converter to the to the bus yeah so you need a path so you can do one more combination or a couple of more combinations here you can connect them both in series with two different transmission lines so what is the purpose of doing this the purpose of doing this would be that if this line was getting overloaded then in theory you can actually take some power out from this transmission line and through this path flow it into the other transmission line okay and one more combination is that we can connect both of these electronic generators in shunt with two systems now you've got one more flexibility is that this transmission or this transmission system is decoupled from this other transmission system why would you want to do that we've got two ac circuits right just think of very simple circuit frequency is different yeah so if there is any change of frequencies between the two circuits then this kind of a arrangement is absolutely required let's say in the us there is no change in frequency the whole country works at 60 hertz we still need these things and they are not only need we we have these things all over why would we why why would we need to do this just think of a very simple two ac circuits right which are same frequency that's right if there is too much of phase difference between the two ac circuits then there will be uncontrollable power flow between the two systems and you want to control that power flow do you have um, different uh, generating plants that uh, generate um, slightly slightly different uh, frequencies let's say one would be 60 plus you know 10 to the minus 6 and the other would be whatever yes um, we have that because we want to enable parallel operation of generators and uh, and they could be uh, they would sense frequency to balance their loading but typically that would be very 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 small they're very closely monitored between the different power plants. absolutely absolutely we do not want any any difference in frequency in fact the frequency specs are as tight as uh, less than 0.2 hertz but this is a real thing so in the us to give you an example the us there is a the western part of the country operates almost like one ac system and the eastern part of the country operates almost as another ac system with large angle or phase difference between the two and so so around the mid part of the country all from the north dakota all the way down to texas there are lots of these what we call back to back systems interconnecting both the systems so in other words i'm trying to say is that we have a very meshed system but the meshing is in two parts one is the western part of the country and one is the eastern part of the country they are not very well meshed together yeah so about reliability what about if several of these converters would be simultaneously taken out of the system for whatever reason terrorists uh, uh, winter storm etc very very big problem very very big problem i mean there's there's uh, redundancies uh, at every level and i'll show you a couple of those things so our job was basically to build these electronic generators which look no different than the real machines and so there is the so how do we go about doing that with power electronics so we go back to very simple building blocks and again this is kind of a tutorial here that if we have uh, two switches with a DC bus voltage, then we can switch them on and off, either the upper switch or the lower switch, and we would connect this point at the output to either the positive DC or the negative DC, and we can create a chopped waveform. And if we keep doing this chopping to approximate a sine wave, then we can think about different kinds of building blocks. So this is what we call a two level voltage source converter pole or a building block. This is a three level because it gives you positive zero and minus DC bus voltage. 
and so on. We can go on from three level to five level and to even what we call cascaded chain links, where you can just keep adding these voltages on series. So, this is nothing, I mean we are not doing anything fancy here, just all we are saying is that we have got a method of series connecting voltage sources. Okay, but we got to do this because we want to build this thing, right? So, we got to build this real converters. So, we take one of these building blocks, everything three phase because that is what we know and all the system is three phase and we take two of these building blocks and we use the transformers as accumulators to add series voltages such that even though each of them looks like this where we have got a three level voltage but it is kind of looks almost like a square wave. So, everybody knows how to do Fourier and you can figure out that the fundamental and the harmonic component of this thing is pretty high. So, we want to go to a waveform which looks more sinusoidal. So, we use the transformer coupling to add these voltages such that with these two three level what we call is we get a 24 pulse waveform. That means we have got 24 steps in a sine wave. Okay. We can carry the same thought and add more voltage sources such that we get a 48 pulse waveform. At that point, at that point, our total harmonic distortion is less than 1.5 percent and is generally accepted as a good enough sign sinusoidal source. So, you see now what we are claiming is that if we have this kind of a thing electronic generator, then it is good enough as a real generator and now this is our voltage source or this is our controllable voltage source that we can put either in series or in shunt with a circuit, right. And we got to control it control all these switchings and these transformers such that they make this waveform. Now, what could be one potential problem with these kind of things? So, so, so first thing we are saying is that look we got very precision switchings required here and I am giving you these angles with these angles the gamma is basically the 0 period here. So, out of out of uh, the 180 the gamma should be exactly equal to 3.75. So, it is it's, it's kind of understood that I need very, very precise switching of these devices. Second thing is that I need these transformers to not only to make to synthesize this voltage waveform and to add these guys up, but I also need this to go from some low voltage to transmission voltages because we are talking about putting these things in the transmission system. So, in other words just to give you a feel of what, so this voltage we need to go up to 345 kV, 230 kV, 138 kV and so on. But our voltages here that we start off with on the DC side cannot be that high. I mean we do not have a storage mechanism for doing that kind of very, very high voltage very easily. So, these voltages are typically on the range of 20 kV or 25 kV and from there we got to jump to 345 kV AC. Okay. Here is another method of actually building the same 48 pulse. So, you see this is a very rich field and rich sandbox for playing around how we can construct from a building block you know in, in some modular fashion a waveform that is almost sinusoidal and there are several ways of doing it and there are several pros and cons of doing such a thing. Okay, one more thing interesting that I want to say here is uh, we all know transformers right and uh, the transformers well transform voltages from low to high, high to low whatever and they have something called a BH curve. And now, if we want to use these transformers in series, then 
we would like that these four transformers have the same pH curve such that they share the voltages equally. We would like that, right. But when we go and buy these transformers from some manufacturer, they cannot guarantee that the two transformers that they deliver will have exactly the same BH curve, right. So, which basically means that the voltage, there will be some voltage difference between the, the secondaries of these two transformers based on whatever the BH curves are. So, keep that in mind, we will come to some problems. So, this is a waveform, you know, of what these things look like. Now, another interesting thing is that we, because we are trying to build these high power voltage source converters, one might think that we really do not need the high bandwidth. So, what does bandwidth mean? Bandwidth means the speed at which we can change our voltage or the phase of the voltage, right. But it is quite the opposite because in the power system, even though these are large rated converters, we need the speed of response. And this is basically trying to show you that if we have these four inverter building blocks that I showed, we can actually change the output voltage in terms of voltage magnitude as well as in phase pretty rapidly. And this is very important because we are building a controllable voltage source. So, we should be demanding that we change the voltage and the magnitude, uh, the magnitude and phase as required. Okay, so, I am going to skip a little bit in interest of time because I want to show you some real stuff. So, so two things from, uh, from the research point of view is that as I said that this, this is a rich sandbox of playing around with topologies which we call topologies of how to make these converters because there can be n number of ways of doing it and there are pros and cons for each way of doing it, right. The other thing is that there is a very challenging control for controlling these converters and I without going into the details here, I want to give you one food for thought. So, this is a result from a real system that I have been involved in commissioning and in the whole project. So, this is a 40 MVA voltage source converter, right. And it is sitting in Korea in some system and it is working as a voltage regulator. So, which means that it is supposed to, to regulate the voltage at the point where it is connected to some specified numbers. Now, in doing so, as we said that the voltage regulator basically requires that we can actually provide from this amplifier or from this voltage source a current which is in out of phase with the voltage. So, we call this thing reactive current. So, or in other words from the AC circuit terminology capacitive or inductive current, right. So, we want to step the current either from, from its full rating capacitive to inductive or from inductive to capacitive, right. That is the function of this converter. So, now you see that this is a real test wave, I mean this is this is a real field waveform, right, measure on a scope. And what I am trying to show here is that when I go, when I make a step change of this controller from 1 per unit inductive, which is 40 MVA inductive to 40 minus 40 MVA capacitive, I get this response. But it is interesting that I have the same hardware, same controller and when I do the other way, I have got a response which looks different from this step response. How is that possible? We have got the same hardware, same controller, right? When you design control systems, we do steps either positive or negative and we are supposed to get the same response, right? I mean either it is a first order system or it is a second order system or it is some higher order system, right? So, how do we explain this? I mean this is clearly different from here and it is not transient, it is it's, it's doing this thing over a few cycles. 
So, all I'm trying to say is that there is a rich area of controls here. This is true. It, it is supposed to happen this way. And there's a reason behind why it is supposed to happen this way. That means that the poles and zeros behaves differently depending on the operating point. Either you're operating here or there. Right? So, the, so all I'm trying to interest you is that there, it's a rich field of controls of trying to figure out these kind of things and to improve the controls. This technology is not too old. This started in 1990s. It's not an old technology. There's a lot of open questions on this. And I'm showing you here the regulation at the bus voltage is 154 kV at that point. And you see this is the, the reactive current as we, as we call it. And this is the bus voltage or the voltage at the point of connection, the black line. And that's the, the green one is the actual current out of this converter. Okay, without going into this thing, I want to jump to something real, which would motivate you to look at this thing a little bit closely. So, in upstate New York, there is a place called Marcy, which is roughly between, it's closer, closer to Santa Cruz than Albany. And, uh, and it is one of the biggest substations that I've ever seen in my life. This is a huge hub, as they call it, because there is a 765 kV transmission line that comes from Canada, carrying 2,000 megawatts of power, which can go up to 3,000 megawatts. There is, Niagara is not too far, and there are three 345 kV lines coming from Niagara, carrying total of probably 2,500 watts of power. 2500 megawatts of power. Okay? All of it comes to this substation. And then three lines go out of this substation. Okay? And typically in this power system world, they like to name these things. So one of the lines is called from Marcy to New Scotland. And this is a 345 kV line going out. There's another line going out, which is called Cooper's Corner. So from Marcy, and there's another, there's a third line going out, which is the, uh, this Gilboa line, okay? carrying a total of probably 3,000 megawatts of power at any time. Okay? One of these lines, New Scotland, after many transmission, uh, after many substations, lands up in Manhattan. This is the main artery for the power in Manhattan. So, as I said, you know, I was lucky to work with uh, this company called Westinghouse, which later got taken over by Siemens Power. And we actually did a huge project. And what was the project about? The project was about installing 200 MVA voltage source converters to operate in many different modes at this substation to do only two things, because only two things we can do is either we can put this voltage source converter in series or in shunt with a transmission line or with a circuit. And we can either control the voltage at the point where we are connected, or we can control the power flow over lines that we are connected. And that was the only two things that we were required to do. Just to give you a magnitude of these projects, this project lasted for five years from the beginning to the end, where we installed all these things. It costs $54 million, okay, just to give you a size. And why is the utility, or why are these people doing it? Because obviously they want to make more money, right? So first thing is that they, they do want to make money because this, this substation was actually a bottleneck. Because there is too much of power coming into this hub and they had no control over the power that was going over these three lines that were flowing out of this substation. So this kind of an investment makes sense because they can actually control the power flow over these different lines going out. And they can regulate the voltage at their own bus. 
to transfer more power. It is all about more power. The power utility companies make money on real power that they supply to the loads, not on the reactive power going in the lines, right? Okay. So, how do we do these things, right? So, I showed you the building block, and if we if we take this this uh, this pole, which we call an inverter pole. So, basically, this is uh, this has a DC and it has got a bunch of switches, which if switched properly would give you a waveform, which is we call three level, because it has got positive, negative and a zero. And this was the starting building block for our converter, as I showed earlier. This is a picture of the real thing. So, these voltages on the DC side, as I said, could be somewhere in the range of 20 kV. 10 to 20 kV. Okay. So, we need a bunch of these semiconductor switches to hold off these voltages and to switch them to give this kind of a waveform. So, this is the hardware that is a building block. So, this is a pole. What does that mean? We have got the DC on this end and these are the bunch of switches connected in series to give you this switch equivalent. This is the bunch of switches connected to in series to give you this switch, and it is wrapped around on the other end to give you these switches and the other switch. And all this is doing is that given a DC bus, it is switching these guys such that you get this waveform at this point. That is all. That is a building block. This is all tested for high voltage, this whole structure. Okay such that if there is a lightning strike at any point, you know it is able to withstand it. So, in other words, all I am trying to say is that from the insulation point of view, it is designed to withstand high voltage. We use these building blocks to make our electronic voltage generator. right? So, this is the what we call the inverter hall at Marcy at that substation. So, there is a big hall and there are two of these converters or two of these inverters that I showed you 100 megawatt. You see this wall here that is the dividing line between the converter number 1 and the other one. These guys are standing on a platform. So, they are raised. So, from the floor this as I showed you that this was our building block. This building block is raised 3 high. So, so, there are three of these building blocks stacked on each other and there are 12 of these building blocks per 100 megawatt converter. So, each of these building blocks is 10 to 12 megawatt. Okay. This is what it looks like. The, the DC is on this side, I do not, I did not have a picture of the, of the DC and these pipes that you see going out through the what we call wall bushings or outside are the AC terminals going out and they go out into these big things called transformers. Okay. And then they get connected to the line. So, this is all real. Okay. More transformers and this is the, the voltage there is the, the bus voltage or the line voltage is 345 kV. So, you are looking at these transformers, which are rated at 100 MVA. This is the shunt transformer, which is rated at 200 MVA and 345 kV on the high voltage side. This itself is an engineering thing. I mean, there is a lot of things, you know, we think what is there to learn in the transformer. There is a lot of interesting things to learn in the transformer. Another interesting food for thought I will give you is that, again, when we think about transformers, we are told that there is something called a magnetizing current, right? And what we mean by that is that the transformer requires a certain amount of magnetizing current to function because it requires a certain amount of magnetizing current to perform its BH curve, right? So, it needs that magnetizing current which is in quadrature to the load current that it is carrying. 
So now let's let's think a stop and think about what what is this magnetizing current and how big it, it is compared to the load current. So as the transformers get bigger and bigger, like a hundred MVA or a two hundred MVA, the percentage of the magnetizing current compared to the load current becomes smaller. So in other words, for this kind of a transformer, the magnetizing current is less than 0.1 percent of the load current. Why do we care? What that is telling us is that if, if we exceed that magnetizing current, then we are going to saturate our transformer. Right? So now typically you know in, in our uh, engineering analysis that we do, we typically use the transformers because they transform voltages. And Typically what we have done in circuit analysis is that, that one side of the transformer has a voltage source and the other side of the transformer is typically a load. Right? And all we are trying to figure out is that you know, what is, if the load has a certain power factor and things like that, what is going to be the loading of my transformer. Here we have a different problem, a little bit different problem, you see, and, but fundamentally very, very important. What we are trying to say is that, hey, we've got this transformer, and on both sides of the transformer, we've got a voltage source. We don't have a load. I mean, this is a transmission bus. It's a source. And this side is a voltage source, because this is the generator we are building. So another food for thought is, hey, in this case, who supplies the magnetizing current? We don't, nobody, actually nobody has solved that. Who supplies the magnet? We would like the magnetizing current to come from the grid, but we are not sure. Why we like it to come from the grid and not from a converter? Because we don't want the converter rating to go up to supply the magnetizing current. That's the first problem. Second problem, as I said, is that look at this number. It's a 100 MVA transformer or 200 MVA transformer. The magnetizing current is less than 0.1 percent of the load current, which means that if I make any error in my switching or any DC volt seconds into my transformer, I'm going to instantly saturate my transformer. What's the solution? Not to make that error, right? Easier said than done. So, or the other solution would be to buy a bigger transformer, right? Or to put an air gap in the transformer such that the BH curve is not square, right? Now, the other interesting thing is that, so we go to the transformer manufacturer and say, hey, guys, we don't know how to control our converters. We would really like you to put air gap into your transformer. And they say, go away. Because with these big transformers, they do not know, this is a fact, they do not know how to control the magnetostriction if they put an air gap, which means that they do not know how to control the forces if there is a fault. So if this transformer undergoes a fault, the forces are going to be so great in the transformer that they will actually shear the windings. And if they put a gap, first they don't know how to control the acoustic noise because of the gap. Second, they don't even know how to, how to, con how to, how to package this, how to hold this such that these things are not going to fall apart. So they will never ever put a gap for these big transformers. So we power electronics engineers have a big challenge of making sure that we never ever put DC into the transformer. Right? That's A. B is go and buy a bigger transformer. Okay, bigger transformer, you, it's, a, it's already a 100 MVA transformer. It looks this huge. Okay, if we buy a 150 MVA transformer, that's 50 percent over rating than what we need. The cost of these guys are in millions of dollars. Okay. Yeah. They are typically, um, uh, they could be as long as, uh, I used to know these things, 17 feet, something like this, for 345 kV bushings. So these, the, you're talking about this guy here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, so this is a 345 kV bushing. This is probably like 15 feet.
Okay. So now let's see what we can do with this. I've got only 10 minutes, right? And I want to show you something interesting. So the <laughs> nine minutes. Okay. Um, so this this is this is one of the most comprehensive facts installation in the world. And we have it right in the US, guys. Okay. This thing can be operated in 11 different modes. This is the operator screen. Okay. And it can be operated either, we call these fancy names for STATCOM, which basically means a shunt device. And SSSC is a series device. And a UPFC is basically a connection of series and shunt. And an IPFC is a connection of series and series. Okay. So that's what we did. And here are some real results. So this, this is, you're looking at the same operator screen that the operator is sitting out there and looking at and controlling. So you can put whatever voltage you want. But let me show you some interesting things. So this is the exciting thing, guys, that, you know, we, we were, when I went to this, this company, I, I wanted to work on this fax thing. And there are very few people in the world who do this kind of work. There was Westinghouse that did this. And, uh, ABB does this in Sweden. And uh, Siemens does some work in, in Erlang in Germany. And Mitsubishi does in Japan. Alstom or Arriva does a little bit in Stafford, England, but not, not too much right now. So there's only two or three places in the world that you can go to to learn about this guy okay, and to work on these things. And the amazing thing that I discovered is that I used to think that there would be an army of people working on these things. There were three young guys like me commissioning this thing on the NIPA 345 KV system. These are commissioning results that we, on the scope, I mean, this is sitting out there. So we had to go through all, all kinds of tests to commission them. And here we see, here you see that we are changing the phase of the current. You know, we are going from inductive to capacitive, capacitive to inductive, and this is what the real scope waveforms look like, okay? We do step response, because that's what the utility wants, right? They want to support the voltage of their transmission line in case of a fault. And so we go from, again, inductive to capacitive, capacitive to inductive, shut down the converter. And there might be other devices on the system that may come on and off at any time. So this is like a capacitor switching on the, on the system coming on. So what that did was that the, the, the converter was operating at some inductive value and because it had a capacitor come on, it, it increased its inductance or inductive current to regulate the voltage at the same point. Yeah. In real time? We, we, we do these things. We cause them through our control. So this is commissioning. This is not the real system responding to a disturbance. Capacitive and to switch? No, no, no. We, we just, uh, we can command. Yeah. We can command that. We can't find a load. Load is not an option. 100 MVA load doesn't exist. Okay. So in series, again, here is, uh, here is the steady state. So the green bars are the voltage injections, and these guys are the, the line currents. So you, said, uh, you see that for the, for the series thing, I said that if we just have one device, then we've got to make sure that there is no power transacted in the device. So that means the voltage and the current has to be in quadrature and almost in quadrature. Okay. So wh why we need this? Because with this thing, we can change the power flow in the line. So this is an open loop voltage injection. So just think about it. In the lab, you have a circuit, you have a controllable voltage source, and you are controlling it to put in a open loop voltages such that you can buck or boost the line current. And in doing so, you can change the power flow of this system. These are real results of that on one line, given the line parameters, we can change the power flow by 60 megawatt. On the other line, we could change it by 100 megawatt. Okay. Again, we are trying to show here that the change in the line current is linear with respect to the injected voltage. And that's a huge deal for the operator, because the operator is sitting there he doesn't have to figure out what is the nonlinear function between the voltage and the current, right? 
he knows it is linear, he knows that if I put in 0.2 per unit voltage, I will get this much of change in my line current for this line. Okay. This is interesting, these are real results from the system, right. So, we wanted that the line power on this line be controlled at 480 megawatts on which this series device was connected, right. So, this is what the voltage, con voltage injection had to do to control this power flow at 480 megawatts and once the voltage went down, the it returned to what the normal power flow on the line, okay. Here we, we did the buck and the boost function of the same thing, okay. We are interested in dynamics and so here we show that we could change the megawatt flow of around 100, mega, uh, 100 megawatt from 570 to 670 over very slow, this is pretty slow, this is 4 seconds per division, this is pretty slow. And then with a UPFC which is basically a connection of, of a shunt converter with a series such that the series device can actually inject a voltage vector or phasor at any angle with respect to the line current. This is again the, the operator screen of injecting voltages and currents and here are the, the power flows that you can change on this line. So, by doing this you can change the power flow by 115 megawatts or 100 megawatts on one line and you can change the reactor power flow also by this much amount. This is the reason why the utilities buy these things or want because they can actually change the power flow increase and decrease based on their requirements. This is again a nice plot of, uh, of what this device could do in the PQ range and uh, again this is real results. We could command that this line be carrying only this much megawatt and this much megawatts and we can dial this thing to zero which means that there would be no reactive losses on the line. And this is what the, the converter does in terms of voltage injection to regulate this voltage at this point or regulate the power flow on this line. Just want to give you this thing and this is amazing guys look at this, they allowed us to do this. Think about it, you are sitting on a transmission line in New York and we changed the power flow from 600 megawatts to 800 megawatts in 400 milliseconds. This is, this is a real thing, guys. this is real scope waveforms. The amazing thing to us was that they allowed us to do this, okay. And, and, and not only allowed us to do this, think about it, the system did not care. The system is so strong at that point, at that bus, the, the, the stiffness of the bus we actually have a number, we, we call short circuit MVA. It shows how stiff the bus is to any change and that was 18,000, that number is 18,000. So, that means something to us, but anyway, I think what I want to show you is that bunch of three guys, you know, like me in the middle of the night doing this thing and they allowed us to do this. Okay. This is real, this is what this device can, we, we never want to do this in real practice, okay. But what I am trying to show is that this is what the device is capable of doing on this kind of a system. Of course, we later toned it down to all kinds of, we had a ramp rate that we could dial in, in our control and we could do this, right. We could do P and Q controls and things like that, okay. So, there is bunch of these things. This is, so all those things we did, right, we, we did. This is what the system did. So, this is the real result and this is why the utility want to buy these things. So, there was a fault on the system in which one of, so these are the three phase voltages and one of the voltages dips and this is what the, the voltage regulator does in terms of giving out reactive power such that it can, it can maintain, uh, sorry, this is the voltages and there is a, there is a bus voltage dip or the B phase dips due, due to a fault, single line to ground fault somewhere 
and this is what the converter does in terms of giving out current to maintain this voltage such that it does not go any lower. Okay. This is why they buy these things. Okay. These are real pictures from the hall, but I want to give you um, one thing here. So, I want to acknowledge again that there was a bunch of these three guys, you know, who were doing this thing over a period of six months, living out there, but the whole project was like five years as I said. So, five years of my life I lived on this project, other things also, but uh, okay. Most interesting is that why should utility believe us? I mean, why should the utility come and say, hey, we want to buy this 50 million dollar asset? Prove us that you have, you can do this, right? So they never believe simulations. So we actually had to build. We we always build what we call a simulator. Okay, a real hardware simulator. And on this simulator, we have the actual controls that are at site, the actual controls. And this was a test bed, so this simulates everything, including the magnetizing current of the transformers. And this was our test bed that we played around to develop our controls, to test the system under faults, to convince the utility that look, these are the results. And when we didn't understand anything at site, we would try to reproduce it on this thing so that we could understand it. One interesting thing is that. Siemens and Westinghouse has given me the simulator and it is out in the lab right now. This is a piece of equipment that was developed over a period of probably 10 years. And for this NIPA system, a lot of it I built. So I have the real controls sitting out there in the lab. We can do the real test, we can repeat all these things. Anyway, I am working with the New York Power on these kind of things and want to thank you. Anybody interested in looking at these things, welcome come to the Freedom Center, I can show you what this piece of equipment looks like and thank you. Westinghouse, uh, did you start with the research or with the project? And how did they develop the idea? It was all research. They were funded. The Westinghouse R&D group was really funded by uh, Electric Power Research Institute in the 1990s, uh, mid 90s, to develop this technology. So this was all, yeah. Could you use this system in the opposite direction, going AC to DC? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And it is used. It is a product, yes. Yes. No, I have not worked on uh, on the high voltage DC, uh, on a real commissioning of a project. I have worked on projects with high voltage, they are called high voltage DC transmission, yes. And that is another whole area. All right, let us thank our speaker again. Thank